Um, flags play quite a lot in our sport, and I suppose we just take them all for granted. But there's an extraordinary history to them and how they evolved, and some of the customs about using them and abusing them. And I thought I'd touch on a few of those things. Now, several people said I should turn it into a talk on flag sequences for racing. But I thought, if you don't already know something about that, um, you probably shouldn't be um, online on, on, and a member of SODA. So I decided to ignore that and just go and talk about flags in general and where they came from. So here we have a customary Dunleary scene, um, the National Yacht Club dressed overall, uh, flying its ensign, uh, shore flagpoles um, and establishments fly ensigns, um, vessels wear them, um, and uh, we might just take it from there. So when just trying to decide on a name for this, I dithered a bit. Um, I could have done that, uh, but I thought that would ensure that nobody would come and listen, although I will bore you a little bit on flag etiquette before we get into the meat of this. Um, I then wondered about how about that for a title, perhaps? And then I thought that might be misconstrued. So I came up with all, all a flutter or all of a flutter. Uh, haven't quite decided which is better. So um, the study of flags is called vexillology from vexa, the Latin for a flag or a banner. And I was unable to find um, a, a physical example of the uh, Shannon One Design Associ Association flag. So this is my best mock-up of it. But flags first evolved as labels um, for people who could neither read nor write and needed to be identified. Um, principally if they were fighting a battle, whether ashore or afloat. So your chap from Sparta or um, ancient Persia or wherever it may have been, needed to know he was attacking the right, the correct side, not his own. So they developed banners and these continued. And I was reading something recently uh, that pointed out that uh, it wasn't until the First World War that the average um, soldier um, could read or write. Um, and therefore, banners and symbols um, played a huge role all the way up to uh, the early years of the last century. Um, I did warn you, I was going to talk about etiquette for a minute. Um, and Etiquette uh, is defined here, um, customary code of polite behavior, or among members of a particular profession, and we all know how the lawyers defer to each other, and indeed, I think medics probably do as well, as well as other professions. My grandfather had a more basic uh, interpretation of it. He used to say it was not, an, not upsetting people unless you intended to do it. Um, and that sort of suits me, I think. Um, flag etiquette then, if we come to that, customary usage of flags at sea, part of it's governed by law, in other words, what you must and must not do, um, and most of it is governed by practice, what you ought and ought not to do unless you want to upset somebody. Now, uh, I see John Bannum on my screen, and I apologize in advance, John, but you know exactly what is coming. Um, I used to sit in an office in Ellsford Terrace. Now, this wasn't quite the view, but unfortunately, they demolished this building, Canada House, um, before I was able to take a photograph of it uh, from the direction that I used to see it, which was from further up Ellsford Terrace. This is the view from Stephen's Green. Uh, 
but it was called Canada House because the Canadian Embassy was based there. And our esteemed friend and colleague, John Bannum, used to administer the Canadian Embassy. And he and I could see each other's office windows. And we often talked about doing flag signaling between the two if we were going to meet for a bowl of soup for lunch. However, one day I was sitting um, on one of those interminable conference calls that lawyers tend to have. And the more people on them, the longer they last. And the more North Americans on them, um, well, then you can multiply the duration by a factor of two or three. Anyway, I was looking out my window and I had to put my phone on mute because I started to laugh. Um, so at the end of the call, I telephoned John and I said to John, um, I'm sure Ireland will do everything it can to help Canada. And I think he thought I'd finally lost it if he hadn't already realized that some time ago. And anyway, the conversation went on, I was teasing him. But you see, what I could see was this. Um, the gentleman who was uh, instructed to hoist the Canadian flag every day had managed to put it up upside down. Anyway, when I pointed this out to John, and uh, I should say, of course, that hoisting your uh, flag upside down is a symbol of distress at sea. So um, I phoned John and uh, he obviously had two telephones because there was an incredible racket on the other one shortly afterwards and the flag was uh, lowered and hoisted correctly. But uh, flags can be important and you, they do send messages. So coming back to etiquette, what to put where? Now I'm indebted to the Kinsale Yacht Club whose handbook has very extensive notes uh, in relation to flags. And this is extracted, um, slightly adapted, but it's extracted from it. So where do you put your ensign? Well, the, it should go in the senior position. Uh, and that is as close to the vessel's stern as possible. And as we know, the ensign shows the country of registry of the vessel, indicating its nationality. Uh, as a matter of law, an Irish flag vessel must wear its ensign as required. And this includes entering or leaving port and on demand. Now, coming to practice, it's recommended it's worn at all times in daylight, uh, when near to or in sight of land or another vessel. An Irish registered vessel should wear the national maritime flag, that's the Irish ensign, the tricolor, unless entitled, and by way of privilege to wear a special ensign, such as our various yacht club ensigns. Wearing anything other than an authorized ensign is a violation of Irish and international law. I had hoped to have a photograph of a fairly notorious Loch Ree, or a supposed Loch Ree ensign with a lot of yellow on it, but the um, purveyor of that um, failed to produce it. And Garrett, I know you're online, so uh, no escape on this one. There are criminal offences um, attached to misusing your ensign. Um, we're not too hot and heavy on it in this country, although we did inherit the old British legislation, uh, which, when applied in Scotland, included um, the death penalty for misuse um, until the middle of the um, second last century. However, in the US, they take it terribly seriously. Uh, and uh, I have a quote there um, from US law. The UK, our near neighbors, um, ha have been reasonably relaxed about it, although they are inclined to ask for warrants or permits for special ensigns. But there's an interesting quote here from Alan Massey, who was recently retired as head of the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency. And uh, he did say that there are cases when the MCA would take an interest. And if they were to do so, the penalties are hair raising, forfeiture of the vessel and a fine of up to 50,000 pounds. So there is something serious in all of this. And uh, particularly if you're visiting another country with your boat, you need to know about um, what is acceptable. 
Now, positioning of ensigns. I said the senior position, which is at the stern, but um, and almost all leisure vessels have an aft staff to which it, from which it can be flown. But some vessels, and principally multi-masted -ma uh, vessels for catches or gaff rigged while at sea, the correct position is at the outer end of the gaff on the aftermost mast or at the aft masthead if it's a Bermudan boat. And for power boats, it may be flown at the aft staff or on a gaff if there is one. And a number of boats on the Shannon I know have small and very neat and attractive looking gaffs on the motor, uh, on motor boats. Now, when to take it down, I suppose is the next point. I'll just catch up with the paper here and when to put it up. In harbour, your ensign should be hoisted at nine o'clock each day. And I know in Loch Ree, Alan Algio is very keen on this, although he's even more keen on taking them down. I suppose it's easier for him to do something about it. Uh, but if there's no crew on board, there's no flag required to be flown. Um, at sea, you should certainly uh, hoist your ensign when entering or leaving port, uh, when you're in foreign territorial waters or when approached by an official vessel. Um, and then lowering or striking your ensign should be done at sunset or 2100 if it's earlier, uh, which is a matter of tradition. And I think that tradition arose um, probably in Britain uh, where um, they preferred not to waste money on new flags all the time. So if you take your flag down at night, uh, it's only being used half the time, so it'll last a bit longer. Uh, there is an exception, which uh, applied in a number of countries until recently, but we adopted it, I think about four or five years ago, um, which is if your ensign is floodlit, you can leave it up in port all the time. Um, obviously, if the crew's going away, the ensign and other flags should be struck. Um, now, for racing yachts, um, the ensign is struck at the five minute gun, or at least the preparatory signal. And in today's world, if there's a class racing flag, and obviously that tends not to apply to one designs, um, that is hoisted. And when the race is over, the class flag should come down and the ensign go back up. Or if you retire, the ensign goes back up. Um, and the class flag or the racing flag effectively replaces the ensign during the race. Which takes me to the topic of racing flags. And of course in Shannon's we all have racing flags, those little square or rectangular flags at the masthead. I was very disappointed to go into Viking Marine a couple of years ago to buy one and ask for it and they said they didn't have them. They didn't do racing flags, but they could sell me a burgee, which when produced uh, was a racing flag. And I think Irish sailing probably have something to answer for there because their instructors are told these things are burgees, but burgees are triangular flags, not racing flags. When I started racing, uh, lots of people had their own personal racing flag. And um, you could register it with what was then called the IYA. I know I, I had one for years, which I used on the Shannon, which was a, a black flag with a white X on it. Um, I seem to remember that an, quite a number of the boats, in, certainly in Dunleary, the cruisers, had their own racing flags, as indeed had some of the dinghy class members. Um, Aoife remembers her father sailing his 12-footer with a red racing flag with an eye on it and that was their personal racing flag. But that seems to have gone now which strikes me as rather a pity. Um, it would be quite fun if all the members of the Shannon One Design fleet designed their own racing flags and then applied to Irish Sailing to register them. Uh, I don't know what answer you'd get. Probably the most famous racing flag in the world, um, that from um, the then Prince of Wales um, cut out the Britannia from the 1890s. There's an old version of this uh, framed in the hall 
in the Royal St George in Dunleary. And um, this one, I gather, I managed to steal the photograph off the web, but I gather is framed and is in Windsor Castle. Uh, and again, this would have been uh, flown at the masthead and lowered when the boat retired. Uh, so lowered. Uh, the other thing that used to happen and uh, has, has gone away, and again, it's rather a pity, was that if you won a race or were placed with a racing flag, you retired that flag and you kept it to the end of the season. And if it was, um, if you'd come first, you kept it unadulterated. If you'd come second, you embroidered a big two on it, or third, you put a three on it. And at the end of the season, then you would go out and display all of these flags as prize flags. Um, and here's the eight meter Aspidel uh, displaying her prize flags at the end of a, obviously a very successful season. And uh, from one of Arthur Fox's books, here's his um, International 14 Avenger, which was the first planing uh, dinghy, or at least the first designed um, 14 to plane and um, they're done rather well uh, as you can see there and if you look very closely you should be able to pick out two of those flags of twos on them and three have threes but uh, that was how it used to be i think it'd be a nice tradition to bring back but there you go um, another thing that we've lost so coming back to what to put where the Burgi, which I might remind you is a triangular flag and a club officer's flags, the ones with two points on them, are, are technically known as broad pennants, uh, should be flown from the masthead. Uh, I'm again extracting from the uh, regulations of Kinsale Yacht Club, which was the only Irish yacht club I could find that actually goes into all of this in, in great detail. But uh, they point out that uh, you may need a special flag hoist pole or a crane at the masthead to do this properly. This would be on a, on a cruiser, um, but uh, it should be at the masthead. Um, and if there's a club defaced ensign, that should be worn uh, with the burgee. And only one burgee should be flown at a time. Some yachts do fly more than one. And the problem then is, uh, which one do you put on top? Let's say you're a member of a very old and uh, well-established yacht club, but you're visiting your other yacht club. So do you put the, I don't know, the Royal XYZ Yacht Club on top because that's been around for 300 years um, and put yours underneath or what? So it causes offense. Uh, you cannot get that particular argument right. So one burgee at a time, I think. Now, a lot of people fly the burgee from beneath spreaders. That is not correct. And as Kinsale so nicely put it, it may cause offence to some club members. Flag, members are, uh, flag officers are permitted to replace the club burgee with their flag officer's flag, only for the duration of their time in office. And on leaving office, uh, they should be given an ex-flag officer's flag and that should be flown from the port spreaders with the club burgee in its usual place um, and for vessels without a mast the club burgee may be flown at the jackstaff on the bow not the national flag as we increasingly see on the shannon um, only warships can fly the national flag or should fly the national flag from the bow So moving on to other flags, starboard spreaders are where signaling flags, such as courtesy flags, the Q flag, which were those of us who cruise are going to have to become more familiar with now uh, with Brexit, um, but not your club bogey from the starboard spreaders. Ah, we're getting the match from somebody. Um, the port spreaders should be used for house flags. And a house flag is normally, but not always, 
a small rectangular version of the club burgee. And you can fly as many of those as you like, but again, good luck to you because uh, if, you, if you get the order wrong and the senior position is at the top, somebody's going to be upset. Now, when we visit another country, uh, it is proper courtesy to fly their flag also. And that should be from the highest position on the starboard spreaders. It's not only a mark of respect, but it's also what we lawyers call an acknowledgement of jurisdiction. I'm in your harbor, so I acknowledge that I need to uh, comply with your laws and customs. Interestingly, the United States Navy, as I understand it, and I know John Leach is on, and he may be able to correct me on this, but I believe the US Navy never put up any courtesy flags at all, which says something. Maybe that will change now with Mr. Biden. Um, house flags, um, as I said, are flown on the port spreaders and can indicate membership of associations or another club. Um, you can also design your own house flag if you like. And uh, back in the days of the big class racing yachts in the 20s and 30s, the racing flag was the house flag. So for example, uh, uh, Sir Thomas Sopwith uh, would have flown a copy of his racing flags on the, on the port spreaders of his yacht tender. Now, when I say yacht tender, this thing was 90 feet long and accommodated about a dozen people, but uh, nonetheless, technically it was as tender. Um, it's a nice gesture if you're in a region that is particularly uh, aware of its um, uh, importance or independence. Uh, it's a nice gesture to fly their local regional flag um, and places where that is really important uh, include Galicia, Normandy and Cornwall. Um, but there are many others. And what you do is you put it below the courtesy flag. Uh, if you're in Brittany, the temptation is to put on up the Breton flag, which all the locals will love, but the gendarmes will get quite shirty about it or can do. Now, um, dressing overall, which we all see, and uh, here is a diagram uh, of the British order for dressing overall. Uh, the background to this uh, and where it first evolved uh, was at Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee in 1896, I think. Uh, there'd been a, a spithead review of the Royal Navy uh, anchored uh, off, uh, off Portsmouth, well, between Portsmouth and, and Osborne House and and East Cows, where the Queen was staying um, 10 years earlier. And at that time, she could actually see the ships, A, because her eyesight was better than it was 10 years later, but B, uh, because uh, the mid-Victorian Navy had black hulls, white superstructures, and cream um, markings. So they were easy, easier to see. By 1896, they were all painted gray and she was practically blind. And uh, when a senior naval officer called and attended upon her and inquired, was she enjoying the view of the ships? Um, she apparently replied, what ships? Uh, she couldn't see them. So something had to be done. And a junior officer was detailed to come up with a sequence of signals that would mix the colors and shapes, but more importantly, not mean anything at all. So uh, this was the order that they came up with and uh, has been used. The US has a slightly different one, but the principle is the same. Um, uh, so that's the order. Um, recommended that the line up to the masthead ends at third substitute and starts at D or uh, delta from uh, masthead to stern. Um, and a second ensign should be worn at the masthead unless an officer's flag, for example, a yacht club Commodore's broad pennant is flown there. Uh, if you get underway, however, the second ensign 
uh, cannot be flown. Sorry, uh, yeah, it cannot be flown um, and the signal flags should be lowered. The consequence of that, if you think it through, is that a flag officer's vessel cannot be underway while dressed overall. So uh, you can uh, remember that when you're uh, dressing up for a regatta. So turning to more local matters, um, we have the soda class flag, but for many years and, it, and still in some places, we use code flag T, uh, um, which of course is the French flag. And I've often wondered why um, and why we didn't um, immediately adopt the soda class flag, although it is used um, increasingly, I think, in recent years. Alan Algio believes, and he told me this uh, recently, that the T um, tango was adopted by, first by Loch Derg Yacht Club. Um, I don't know. Perhaps it's because of the colours of it. Um, but I'm not sure it couldn't be, it's the French flag. So, but anyway, I've always been curious as to why we use tea and, 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 and not the uh, shamrock. Now, Shannon One design rate related club flags. I think we all know these. Um, the one on the right, and um, I apologize for the poor reproduction, but it's my bad scan uh, from Vincent Delaney's recent excellent book uh, showing the double-headed eagle of the North Shannon Yacht Club. Um, the Lockery flag, I know, comes from the town coat of arms and was adopted, I think, in the 1890s, um, according to Billy English's history of the club. Um, the North Shannon Yacht Club um, burgee uh, shows the Lloyd family crest, and they were local landowners who were founders of the club. I, I've no idea, and perhaps somebody can help me, and uh, we might have a chat at the end, where the three shamrocks of uh, Loch Derg came from. Now, we all know these ones, but what about this one? Um, now, if Tom Saunders uh, or Alan Algio are on, they'll both know this one. Uh, I didn't catch that, but uh, this is the Loch Derg Corinthian Yacht Club uh, with the granny knot, suitably uh, Corinthian, uh, which was the breakaway, of course, from Loch Derg Yacht Club uh, that lasted for a number of years. Uh, up. Corinthian, presumably because no paid hands involved in sailing the boats, which perhaps explains the dominance of the knot. I failed to find uh, a physical version of this one, uh, but this from the, um, from the records was the burgee, at least the triangular part of it, was the burgee of the Kilinure Yacht Club, which was founded in 1831 on Temple Island on the inner lakes um, off, off Wineport uh, in Loch Ree. Now, uh, my understanding is that the split there happened for a number of reasons, but one of them was uh, that the members uh, of the Kilinur Yacht Club were more interested in evolutions um, than picnics. Uh, the Athlone Yacht Club was very keen on picnics, uh, but again, Vincent may well be able to uh, shed some light on that at, at the end. Now for one that never was, but actually might have been. Um, the Royal Lockery Yacht Club, you think I'm joking? Well, listen to this. On 28th October 1947, the Lockery Yacht Club wrote to Her Majesty's Armed Secretary of State at the Home Office in London SW1, and I quote, Sir, I have been looking over some old papers belonging to this club. There was some discussion among members about trying to get it raised to the status of royal. 
I'm sorry, there's more substance to this than the letter that circulated, I think, in Loch Derg about 10 or 15 years ago. Um, the letter continues, I should be greatly obliged if you would let me know what would have to be undertaken and what cost would be involved. Also, would a club in this country be eligible? And I remind you, this was October 1947. Uh, a Home Office minute of the 6th of November 1947 said, quote, the whole of Loch Ree is in error and it would seem desirable in the first place to refer the letter to the Commonwealth Relations Office on the question of procedure. In this country, freshwater yacht clubs are not now granted the title royal. Send a copy of the letter semi-officially to the Commonwealth Relations Office for observations regarding procedure. That was done on the 13th of November 1947. The covering letter said, among other things, quote, there has been no grant of the royal title to a freshwater sailing club in England since 1887, when the practice relating to the grant of the title royal was not stabilized. I wonder whether you could let us have particulars about this club, its membership, reputation, and the number of yachts it owns with their tonnage. We should also welcome any suggestions relating to procedure on the assumption that the application will be pursued. The Commonwealth Relations Office replied to the Home Office on the 6th of December, 1947, with these amongst other paragraphs. Quote, I enclose a copy of a note prepared in July of last year on the general principles covering the grant of the title royal in the various Commonwealth countries. You will no doubt appreciate that in the case of error, difficulty would arise in the application of these principles. It would appear, however, from paragraph three of the enclosed note, that consideration would only be given to applications from institutions similar to the club in question. If exceptional circumstances exist, we feel that in this particular case, no indication should be given in any reply, which you may make to the club, of the likelihood or otherwise of any application meeting with success, and that they should only be informed that being in error, the matter should be raised through the appropriate authorities in error. Pause. On 17th December 1947, the Home Office wrote to the Lockery Yacht Club saying, quote, with reference to your letter of the 28th October last regarding the procedure and the cost involved, in making an application for the grant of the title royal to the Lockery Yacht Club, I am directed by the Secretary of State to say that as the club is in error, the matter should be raised through the appropriate authorities in error. Ireland at the time had a Fianna Fáil government led by Eamon de Valera, who was not known for being well affected towards crown and empire, although he was supportive of continuity. Uh, for existing royal institutions such as the RDS and Royal Sporting Clubs. Long pause. On 29th of April 1948, the club responded to the Home Office. Sir, referring to yours of 17th December 1947, we've been in communication with the Irish government and I enclose their reply, from which I understand that they will not interfere either for or against. I sent their letter to the UK representative and enclose his letter also. As the Irish government has not refused permission for the club to be raised to the status of royal, would his majesty therefore be gracious enough to confer on the club the title of royal? On the 10th of May, 1948, the Home Office replied, with reference to your letter of the 29th April, as to the application for the grant of the title royal to the Lockery Yacht Club, I am directed by the Secretary of State to say that as the club is situated in ERA, the Secretary of State for the Home Department has no jurisdiction in the matter and can add nothing to the letter addressed to you on the 21st of April by the United Kingdom representative to ERA. The enclosures to your letter are returned herewith. The return of those enclosures has deprived us of the opportunity to see exactly what the Irish government and the UK rep said to the club. By then, the Irish general election of 4th of February 1948 had returned the first inter-party government 
led by John A. Costello, and with Sean McBride, leader of Clown Republica, uh, as Minister for External Affairs. The Republic of Ireland Act was signed into law on 21st December 1948, depriving the King of Ireland of his last functions in the form of free state and depriving the Lockery Yacht Club of its last chance to acquire the title royal. Would be interesting to know what Sean McBride, who'd been boating on Lockery since the 30s, thought of the club's application. Anyway, there you are. It might have been, but it wasn't. So, um, use of flags. Well, communication. And there are two sets of code flags commonly in use, the naval signals and the international code flags, which we're all familiar with, and which we race to. Although anyone who sails a flying 15 would be accustomed to the naval code six, which is their class flag. Probably the most uh, famous signal ever made by flag in the English language is this one, uh, Nelson's signal before the engagement at Trafalgar, uh, made in naval code. Uh, England expects that every man will do his duty. And here we see from um, a book not long after the time, uh, showing how it would, part of it would have been displayed as it was a very long signal and would have taken quite some time to get through. Uh, probably the most uh, argued about signal uh, ever made and using the uh, phonetic alphabet at the time of the First World War of Charlie for C and London for L was equal speed Charlie London. This was the um, deployment signal made by Admiral Jellicoe uh, when not being told by his scouts and by the um, battlecruiser squadron where the German fleet was, had to make an educated guess, uh, which he did and which worked absolutely perfectly. And the British fleet deployed uh, into line ahead um, in an arc around the north of the German fleet uh, and should have won the battle. Uh, that signal almost certainly um, initiated the greatest loss of life caused by a flag signal ever made. And uh, for those anoraks, uh, I left my anorak outside in the hall, but for those of us anoraks and flags is probably the second most famous one ever made. And it's repeated um, on the anniversary of Jutland uh, from the uh, main shore bases of the Royal Navy and indeed by the US Naval Academy as a mark of respect, the US Naval Academy in uh, Annapolis. So rapidly catching up with the slides. Um, there's a couple of books on this topic if you're interested. Here's one of them. Um, and I should say, every signal made and received by a warship is logged. And there are books published of them through, in particular by the British Admiralty, a uh, very useful source of information for naval historians. A more interesting and more fun book is Charles Brune's Make Another Signal, uh, which if you are interested in, in the topic, um, but uh, this shows a photograph of Iron Duke, which was um, Jellicoe's flagship, uh, making the um, making the Jutland deployment signal. So moving on, uh, there have been a number of uh, amusing signals made by flag over the years. Um, in 1917, when the United States entered the First World War. They sent a squadron of warships to scap a flow to join the British fleet and to reinforce it. But of course, they weren't accustomed to uh, British signaling methods uh, and exercise. And uh, on one deployment in fog, um, uh, 
a, a US um, warship was found um, making this signal. The top flag here is the church pennant. The lower one is the naval interrogative flag. And when asked by uh, Morse code what he meant, his response was, for God's sake, where are we? Uh, another well-known one was this, um, SNAP. Uh, this is in the signal log of HMS Queen Elizabeth, which was the named uh, battleship of the uh, class, the Queen Elizabeth class of battleships. She encountered the uh, Cunarda Queen Elizabeth in mid-Atlantic uh, in 1943. Uh, the Queen Elizabeth was heading east with a full complement of US troops. And uh, as I say, met her namesake, uh, sake, and that was the signal. Um, in the signal log of uh, one of HM trawlers in the North Sea in 1941, um, what is the significance of that signal? And the reply by voice was, oh, it's the crew's laundry. Um, the late Hardest Waller told me this story, but I'd actually already heard it elsewhere. Um, and it involves um, an exercise by the British Mediterranean fleet in the 1950s uh, when um, a flotilla of destroyers was uh, uh, maneuvering using flag signals. And unfortunately, the leader of the destroyers, um, repeating an incident that had happened a hundred years earlier in the Med or almost a hundred years earlier in the Mediterranean fleet, he signaled all his, um, his followers to turn to starboard and promptly turned to port himself and rammed the flagship. And um, I'm afraid this signal was made by Loudhailer, but what do you intend to do next? And the uh, unfortunate Captain D responded by a farm in Dorset, sir, which I think was probably, um, uh, probably appropriate. Uh, that was the occasion when HMS Diamond hit Swiftshore. Uh, at the fleet exercise in 1955. There are various other flags, uh, special flags. I hope you all recognize this one, uh, colloquially known as the gin pennant. Uh, in other words, we're having a party. You're very welcome. Um, I know I certainly have one on Scalavar, although we haven't had much use for it in the last year. Um, and there are other special flags. Uh, the older yacht clubs, and that includes the Shannon clubs uh, and the older Royal Yacht Clubs, all had private signal books. Um, I know that the signal book for the Royal Irish uh, still uh, survives, it's in the museum there. Uh, Adrian O'Connell down in Kilrush has one for the old Royal Western Yacht Club of Ireland. And they were full of individual uh, flag group codes uh, to do with the organizing of evolutions and communication that couldn't be read by other people. Now, you're on the Shannon Estuary or you're perhaps sailing from the Kilinio Yacht Club on Temple Island and you put up colored flags. I'm not sure that too many people are going to be trying to read them other than other members of the club. But uh, they each had them and they were all slightly different. They were also used for entertaining and uh, you would anchor beside your friend, for example, and you might signal, have you ladies on board? Or you might be short of food and uh, certainly in the uh, Royal Western one, there's a signal, may I have three carrots? Um, the Royal Yacht Squadron had to add one to their code book after their first um, admiral, Lord Yardborough, gave a signal, uh, rather like HMS uh, Diamond, he gave a signal to do such and such, and uh, then follow me. So they all promptly did such and such, followed him and ran aground. So the Royal Yacht Squadron um, had a signal, do as I say, not as I do. But there's plenty of fun in these. Uh, we're all familiar, I think, with this and the international code. And as well as meaning a letter, each of them also has an individual meaning. For example, Foxtrot, uh, I am disabled, communicate with me, or 
the Q flag, which actually means my vessel is healthy. It doesn't mean that we've got play. Um, my vessel is healthy. I request free, free practique. Um, but there's a full code book, which actually I must pick up, excuse me, for one second. Okay. Okay. No, no, but I'll give it to the Yeah, which I will show to you at the end, but I just need to remember to have it here. But it is full of multiple code signals. Um, now, it consists of the answering pennant, the substitutes where you've already used a letter, and one, two, and three letter codes, and some of them are quite useful. Um, that's inviting somebody to a party. Request pleasure of company, to which the reply is, except with thanks or much regret unable. Now, uh, almost 50 years ago, I was sailing on the original Asgard and uh, we'd been on a fairly long trip. And the result of that was that the crew were reasonably handy and we were able to do things like uh, anchor under mizzen and backed uh, staysail, which we did and were quite pleased with ourselves and celebrated. Um, we'd come into the anchorage just about dark. We were up in the Hebrides and we had noticed a rather magnificent schooner uh, with um, Royal Yacht Squadron colours anchored nearby. The following morning there was a tap on the hull and there was a beautiful varnished uh, dinghy with a man in it and he handed in a letter for our skipper and uh, it was handed down below and he held on to the rail and he inquired um, would there be a reply so we heard the envelope being opened and duly read and the answer was not now so we ultimately went to sea and we asked uh, skipper eric healy what was in the letter and he said, oh, some nonsense. But eventually he showed it to us. And it was Yacht Centurion, I think was her name, uh, Royal Yacht Squadron, uh, lying at Bowmore, Isle of Isla. Uh, Kindly take your flag times from me. I am senior yacht here. And signed with a surname, so presumably a peer of the realm. Anyway, we forgot about it. But a couple of days later, uh, we sailed into uh, Loch Scavig uh, on the southern side of the Isle of Skye and we anchored. Uh, but on the way in, there was the schooner. Eric went below and he produced the code book and he ruffled through it and said, go and find me Mike Juliet Foxtrot, which we did. And we hoisted it as we sailed past. And as we sailed past, we could see the glint of the field glasses and no response. Um, Eric hid the code book, but in due course, we found it. Uh, it's from the medical section. Uh, the patient is expelling wind. Um, so I think that we got our own back. He got his reply. Now, uh, a few signals that might have been. How about this one? I've lost my bathing costume, or uh, one we've all felt like making when we're uh, when we're racing. Uh, I don't know what it says, but it's a four-letter word. Now, a little bit of history. Um, in uh, in early Edwardian times, uh, there was a huge amount of development in naval ordnance. And a man called Samuel Whitehead uh, invented the torpedo. And this is important for the next bit of, of flags. Um, this is a brooch given by Edward VII to his mistress, Mrs. Keppel, whom you may know or may or may not know is a great grandmother of um, the Camilla Duchess of Cambridge. So, sorry, Duchess of Cornwall, I'm being corrected here uh, by our local royalist. Uh, 
by the uh, Camilla's great grandmother. And he presented her with this. Uh, now, I did not label the um, broad pennant as a bread burgee, but it came with this image, so we're stuck with it. And uh, this is what it means in naval, or meant in naval signals at the time. So anyway, you can make of that what you wish. Uh, those of you with a dirty mind will perhaps make more of it than others. And uh, that's it. A little flutter through flags. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, very many thanks. And uh, if anyone wants to ask a question, I'm open to it. I don't guarantee to know the answer. But thank you very much for listening. David, thank you very much. Um, there is there there were a few comments and there was one question in the chat box. So I'll I'll open up with that um, and then I will invite anyone uh, to add any comments or questions. Um, so the question in from DJ, I think, David, for retired flag officers, if there are two such people aboard, may one fly both flags or just the ranking one? I think that's a matter of common sense and how many people you're going to upset. That's not you. I'll mute yourself there now. Don't mute yourself. I think Carmen might have been trying to get in there. Yes, uh, I, I, that was a terrific lecture, David. So very, very informative and with full of fun and everything. Uh, I want to add a little bit to the story, though. Um, when the uh, 1922, as you know, Lockery Yacht Club is located in a very traditional Republican area, and uh, up, up to 1922, I think that the ensign of the club had the Union Jack in the corner. It was a defaced Union Jack. And actually, I remember old flags with that in the starter's hut. Now, after 1922, we didn't fly any ensign at all, seeing as we were in the Coosin area. And it's very interesting what you said about the application uh, to become a Royal Yacht Club. I could think of nothing less suitable in Coosin, but however, uh, 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 because the date was very interesting. Um, you, you have this correspondence, which was, of course, uh, the work of, of Captain Arthur Will Smith, um, known as Squeaky, uh, because he'd been out in the First World War. And kind people said he'd been shot in the throat, and that accounted for his squeaky voice. Less kind people suggested that. That he might have taken a bullet somewhere else. However, uh, he was <laughs> Lord High Everything in Lockery Yacht Club. In fact, his nickname was Pooba because of uh, that. However, the, the thing is this that he's turned down for this idea of Royal around 1948 uh, or so. And then the inter party government comes in soon afterwards. And is it a, and the interparty, Sean McBride in the interparty government pushed, you know, the idea of Irish republicanism and Irish unity. And I'm wondering, is it a coincidence? Or was there a leak about correspondence somewhere? Because around 1950, um, it was arranged under a little bit of pressure that the tricolour would be flown over Lockery Yacht Club. And um, uh, Paddy Lenehan, who was the chairman of the county council, and who was also, he would have been Mary O'Rourke and Brian O'Lenahan's father, uh, he, uh, he, was a, he was also a member of the club. And um, he uh, hoisted the tricolour over the old clubhouse. And in front of the clubhouse uh, was a guard of honour uh, of Coosin men. Uh, who, I don't know whether they were, you could call them the IRA, I don't think so, but they certainly were of a Republican uh, bent of mind. And of course, the club caretaker at the time, Simon Mulvihill, was, a, was a, a, an old IRA man uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of considerable uh, renown. 
Uh, so uh, at the same time, or in or around the same time, now that happened, and I actually have seen a photograph of it, so it did happen. And uh, about the same time, uh, the, I believe uh, the tricolour was hoisted on that pole that used to be at the end of Goose Island at Loch Derg Yacht Club uh, that the Levag used to tie up to. And I think perhaps it was hoisted by Neddy Hogan, who was a well-known uh, uh, inhabitant of Drummondier, indeed a very nice man. I knew him quite well. Now, I'm just wondering, was there some coordination going on or some leakage of information from government departments or through politicians or so on about it? Anyway, the outcome of all that was that, as far as I know, uh, that Loch Durg and Loch Ree wrote to the Department of Industry and Commerce, which governed those matters on this island, or in, quote, the era, unquote, at the time, and, uh, and asked them, could we fly a defaced tricolour? And they agreed that we could, and that's why the two clubs have a defaced tricolour, and they had an official litter, uh, giving them permission to do so, which I suspect very few other uh, yacht clubs or other organisations that fly a defaced tricolour in Ireland actually have. So it's an interesting story. I would very much, I saw this photograph of the Guard of Honour with Paddy Lenehan on the, on, the, on the clubhouse roof about 1950. So it did happen and I would very much like to uh, get my hands on that photograph again because I think it's a very historic one that is worth hanging in the, in the club, but I haven't managed to do that. Uh, so thanks again, David, for a wonderful lecture. I hope that adds a teeny little bit to it, but only modestly. Uh, just to put in about the, the, uh, the letter, it's, it's actually a warrant. And um, yes. I have a copy yeah. of it here somewhere. David Beatty was asking me to root it out, not yes. for, for something else. But the um, interesting thing is that the colour is actually azure blue, which is what I call child of Mary blue. A very light blue. Yeah. And I think probably Derg is the same. And I think a lot of Derg boats actually do use it. And we should probably use it. But um, we've always, and I think both clubs, we've always liked to use the, the navy blue. But that's not actually the colour which we are correct. warranted to wear. I think that's correct. Yeah. I've always had the correct colour. I think Reggie is, wants to add something. A fascinating talk, David. Thank you very much. I always remember years ago that you produced a, a flag signal to say we would go to church in one hour's time uh, <laughs> up in the flag staff at Loch Derg. But going through the archives some years ago, um, about 1895 or 1896, uh, the club stopped using, the Loch Derg <laughs> club stopped using the Prince of Wales feathers on its um, programs and headings and then started to use the shamrock and it always fascinates me why they did it then because they were still effectively uh, a british territory uh, you know part of the empire uh, but it's very interesting but that is the first uh, record that i came across i'd have to actually chase it on to <laughs> give it the back date but it's either one or the other thank you David, uh, thank you very much. What determines the colour of the ensign, it, be it blue or red? And should the colour of the burgee of a yacht club or whoever flies it be the same colour as the ensign? Ah, well, th th there's a huge amount of history in that, Philip. Um, I mean, our practice and custom derives from that of, of the United Kingdom because of what we inherited. And uh, obviously Harmon has, has filled some of that in. But if you go back um, to the 1820s and early 1830s, um, in Britain, um, they had three colored ensigns. They had a white one, uh, a blue one and a red one. And interestingly, they considered the red one to be the senior one. And 
the Royal Navy was divided into three fleets and the, each of the fleets had a different coloured ensign. So the Channel Fleet had the red ensign and the Admiral of that was known as the Admiral of the Red and he was the senior Admiral and so forth. Um, and a number of yacht clubs that were founded and had applied for uh, the right to a defaced ensign uh, were granted uh, different, differing coloured ensigns at, th at that time. Um, in the 1830s, they decided to reorganise the fleet and that the Navy would have the white ensign, which they still have. Uh, that's the white ensign with the George's Cross and the Union flag in the first quarter. Um, and they looked around and they revoked all the um, warrants for white ensigns from the various uh, yacht clubs and, and other institutions. Uh, the Royal Yacht Squadron, which of course was hugely influential, uh, I mean, you basically had to be a peer of the realm to be a member, uh, and it helped if you'd been an admiral, uh, objected to this and said, well, they basically played for the Royal Navy through, the tax, through their taxes and they were going to keep the White Ensign and there was a compromise and they did. However, when they wrote to the various clubs, they omitted to write to the Royal Western Yacht Club of Ireland, which was based on the Shannon. So they continued to hold this warrant. I know I'm not directly answering your question, but I will come to your question in a moment. But they continued to hold it. And everybody wanted a white ensign. Nobody in trade or who wasn't of basically of blue blood could get into the Royal Yacht Squadron. So all of a sudden, the Royal Western Yacht Club of Ireland became the largest yacht club in the world with all sorts of overseas and country members and so forth. And they were turn up in cows with a, with a, a transcribed copy of their warrant. And uh, after a long period of time, uh, there was a, a lot of acrimony and um, questions in parliament and eventually they were quashed. And all of a sudden, nobody wanted to be a member of it except the locals and it rather died. That's a rather long-winded way of saying that these things evolve. Um, the Royal Irish, for example, had a white ensign, um, lost it, and then was granted a blue ensign, um, which was, it felt was senior to the red. Uh, the Royal St George, of course, was founded in Dunleary uh, as the Kingstown Royal Harbour Boat Club and then became the Royal St. George, which may have had something to do with St. George and the George's Cross, and a desire to have a white ensign on a George's Cross, but didn't get it, but got a red ensign, uh, but had a red and white, uh, a red and white um, burgee. More recently, if we come back to the Royal Irish, for example, um, it had a navy blue ensign to match its navy, uh, and a navy blue, Burgee, which it still has, and they matched. Um, but it has a white Irish ensign now and a different coloured Burgee. So these things just evolve over time. Um, some clubs in Britain would have designed for themselves blue Burgees, hoping they could get matching ensigns and didn't get them. And then it was too late and people didn't want to buy new ones, so they didn't redesign them. So the whole thing now is a hodgepodge. But I agree with you, if you have a, an ensign that matches the Burgee, it really does look very smart. But this thing has just been a hodgepodge and uh, various people have taken initiatives over the years. Some of them have succeeded, mm. others haven't. Bill Burgee, sorry about that. Thanks very much. Can I ask a question, David? Sorry, could I answer Philip's question? <laughs> Um, sorry, Gar. just before you move on to the next yeah. question, could I just uh, answer Philip's one? So the red duster is for all the merchant ships and uh, not normally for flown on, on yachts, sorry, and is also flown on yachts. In other words, you don't have um, a blue dust, a blue ensign. And so the blue ensign is flown by the Royal Navy, uh, by the Royal Naval Sailing Association, Britannia Yacht Club. And uh, there's a Morgan Giles story in this. So I used to sail and race uh, Morgan Giles 43s uh, when I was in Dartmouth. 
And uh, so they carried a white ensign and a blue ensign. And so uh, when we were racing, it was blue and uh, for everything that was formal, it was white. Um, the, 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 obviously the, the um, Royal Yacht Squadron had the entitlement of flying the, the um, a white ensign and obviously all the Royal Yacht, the Royal Yacht Britannia, she also flew, obviously flew uh, the white ensigns as well as the Royal Standard. So that's my uh, best answer to Philip's question. So, so unless you're in a, a Royal Navy Yacht Club, um, uh, you fly the Red Duster and if you are Royal Navy or Royal RNSA, uh, Royal Naval Sailing Association, then you can fly the Blue Duster or the, the Blue Ensign <laughs> and white then for Royal Navy when you're on official uh, duties, shall we say. Thank you. Sorry, Gareth. Um, that's for, thanks, John. Um, so, just in passing, I, um, the Irish government not so long ago um, appointed the Royal Institute of the Architects of Ireland as its statutory registration body, um, somewhat to my embarrassment, other than the name is. Um, so, they, they seem to have uh, not be so shy about being associated with the word royal anymore. But anyway, my question is this. You mentioned flagship. And in naval battle situations, and I suppose the most recent one that we all know about is probably the Falklands, is there one ship in the fleet which is designated as the one from which all the others take their signals? And in modern war warfare, uh, naval warfare, do they actually bother with flags or is it all done by radio? Well, I, I would defer to Lieutenant Commander Leach on this, except to say that in the First World War, flags were still used but didn't really work because the smoke got in the way and the distances were so great that people couldn't see them. Uh, but uh, John, I'm sure, can, can answer your question. Yeah, so the Americans um, about 20 years ago discontinued using the flags and so other navies, except the Royal Navy and the Germans and quite a few of the European navies uh, didn't. But Ireland decided that we give it a break as well for, uh, and it was only for about three years when they realized the importance and the value of it. Because uh, it is one of, in terms of, um, of communication, it is one of the most secure means of, of communication. That, and of course, the Aldous la light, which you use, we use as well, that was discontinued for a few years. All navies are using it again because they realize it's so secure. It's probably the most secure means of, of communication of all. But the flags are still used, yeah. And as David rightly said, um, there's a whole a naval language in terms of flags, totally different than the ones that, we're, we're, that we would use, the International Code of Signals, uh, the, uh, including the one that David mentioned, the, um, uh, Reggie mentioned, sorry, the, the church pennant, which I think it was, I can't, I think it was either David or Reggie or both, or a, a number of people um, asked me to go and get one, which I duly did. Uh, haven't seen it since in Lockdown. I think it might have, might have been <laughs> nicked by somebody. But there we go. So thank you. Yeah, well, it's, it, thank the you. church pennant isn't on board Scolivar, I can tell you that. <clears throat> One thing I didn't cover was just dipping of ends um, and the custom with that to salute a senior officer or whatever. But it, it, it's quite a nice thing to do. Um, I remember back when the uh, classic boat regattas were going on and uh, Rachel Leach and I uh, 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 would um, appear in the sailing barges and dip ensigns to whoever was organizing the event and fire off an, an, an appropriate number of guns to market. It caused quite a fuss in Loch Erne, I seem to remember, because we worked out they had an admiral and he was entitled to 17 guns. So there was an awful lot of noise and smoke. I'm not certain what the PSNI made of it, but uh, anyway. But one of the unfortunate things is that um, uh, a number of navies no longer uh, bother acknowledging these because the custom was that you would salute a warship if you saw it by just lowering your, your, your ensign halfway down and then wait till they dip theirs and then you hoist it. You would have seen this happening with Phoenix leaving Loch Ree at the end of the regatta, for example. But the, uh, certainly the Royal Navy no longer acknowledges um, 
dips from mere yachts. I remember coming out of Cherbourg on a cruising yacht on one occasion and we met nine French minesweepers and just out of badness because we had nothing else to do it was light weather and we didn't have enough fuel to motor across the channel so we were sort of jilling along we dipped to each of them in turn which caused absolute chaos the leader spotted it and he sent a man down and they dipped and we and responded but about halfway along they really didn't notice until the last minute and the penultimate guy was in such a rush, he ran along, he let go of the halyard and his ensign fell in the sea. So um, we, had, we had a bit of fun with that. But as I say, the, the Brits no longer do it. Um, and I don't think the Americans ever did it. So um, you, Irish naval service are excellent at it. And if you ever are sailing at sea and you see one of our own ships, dip to them and you will get a smart response. I'm delighted to say. Thanks, David. Any final comments? Any final questions? Well, David, thank you very much for a, a great talk. I, I have here a document which uh, describes itself as evolution signals. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't say whether it's from Lockery or from Loch Derg, but it comes from Father's archives. So it could. So I think the North Shannon never did evolution signals, so it wouldn't be the North Shannon. But for example, flag C, starboard division, flag D, port division, F, sailing yachts, G, steam yachts, H, alter course after me together, J, alter course after one in succession, K, bear away together, and so on. So it's actually an interesting document, but unfortunately, there's no way of knowing where it actually came from. Now, furthermore, I think that with the uh, with the Killinger Yacht Club, I think that they changed their signals pretty well every time that they went out. So it was part of the exercises that you were given a new set of signals, again, in the interest of security, so that uh, a, a going to church signal wouldn't be missed wouldn't be confused with whether you have ladies on board or vice versa. So that, that's my comment. Thank you very much. And sorry, if I could um, add to Vincent's comments there, I'd, I'd be almost certain uh, that that came from the Royal Cork Yacht Club. As you probably are all well, well, well aware, it was mainly army officers and naval officers who were involved in these early or sailing uh, manoeuvres. Uh, the Royal Court Yacht Club was, virtually, uh, ma was mainly, uh, artillery officers were, were, were one of the main regiments who really enjoyed and were very good apparently at the manoeuvres. And so it being the senior club and because they were posted from, uh, I mean, as you know, Athlone is a garrison town particularly, um, and Nina would have had a barracks for, for quite a long time as well uh, in, the, in, in those earlier, say, go back two, two centuries or so. So the senior yacht club, Royal Court Yacht Club, uh, wasn't known as that at the time, but um, it, it, they took their they took all their signals from the oldest yacht club in the country, and they were spread. There was a standard language, if you like, throughout. So because you'd have an officer who'd be serving in Cork, he'd be post post up to Athlone or posted to Nina, and that's where it, that's where all the language came from. Okay, thank you, John. If you'd be so kind, um, he's going away now. He's away from his camera, Mr. Leach. <laughs> Um, could you tell us about the creation of the Loch Carib ensign or the Kong ensign, whichever it be? Oh, we need Tom Kelly. Uh, uh, Philip Main might might remember something. So that's the you know, the Carib Sailing Club, you mean, which by the way did not have a warrant to fly one, and and nor did Galway Bay Sailing Club until I joined it about twenty years ago. Or so they didn't have a warrant either. So. I got the warrant. It took about two and a half years. Civil servants in Ireland or uh, in that particular Department of Transport wouldn't see it as a priority. So it, did, it literally took, I'd say, almost two years of writing letters before we got the warrant for Galway Bay Sailing Club. Uh, Carb Sailing Club, um, it, didn't, uh, it, it didn't have one. It never had a, a warrant, I'm, I'm, I'm almost certain. Uh, but uh, yes, Tom Kelly, the, oh sorry, the uh, actual reason, uh, the emblem on it, which is on the Loch Corrib plate, which Reggie 
very kindly um, represented that uh, I think his brother had actually won that that plate. Um, but so it's in Ishpo, the island of the, the cow. Um, and I, I think that that's the one you're referring to. I think okay. it's actually, John, was there something about um, jumping up on a bar table? The, uh, the Loch Corrib Ensbergi was designed in Kiltoom at the same time as it was proposed to actually okay. have the regatta in Loch Corrib in 1964. And the whole thing took place, I think, on the Wednesday of Loch Re Regatta when they went up for lunch. And uh, it was um, Buddy Goodbody who, who really instigated the whole thing and suggested to Oliver that as he had an, a house on an island in Loch, on Loch Corb, then they may perhaps hold a regatta. And the next entry in uh, Bonnie's history then said they there and then designed the Burgee. And in order to uh, become a member of Loch Corb Yacht Club, you had to jump up backwards onto the bar without actually using your hands. And apparently they all joined, apart from Eric Hooker, who uh, declined to become a member. And he there and then was made an honorary member. <laughs> uh, you're absolutely right. It, it was completely, it was never registered. Uh, and I'm not actually sure whether there is a, a Burgee in existence, but certainly it was flown during the regattas uh, for the five regattas that existed. Just, um, I, I have here um, a, uh, an annual regatta program from Loch Ree for 1926. And um, it's interesting insofar as the course, for one of the courses, there were four courses, but I'll just read the course and then I'll tell you about the flag. So you start on the line opposite the clubhouse, thence round the mark off viewpoint, then round the mark off Hare Island, back to the starting line. Leave all marks on the starboard hand. Course reversed on the second round. Marks to be left on the port hand, finishing between the flags and the starting line. Wasn't that, that was a much better than having all this compass nightmare and trying to see where the wind is coming from. But anyway, the signals, um, they're not that much different, but uh, a gun will be fired 15 minutes before each race and the class flag of the race broken out. A second gun will be fired five minutes before the start and the blue peter broken out. After five minutes, a third gun will be fired for the start and the blue peter and class flag will be lowered. Time should be taken from the flags and not from the gun. Now, if either a yacht or a centerboard race is stopped on the first round, a black ball will be hoisted on the shore mast and the recall flag broken out on the main mast. Boats are then to finish between the mast and the line straight across the line. So that's not that much difference to how it's done today, except that the courses, we don't reverse the course. It's quite fun, actually, at the weather mark or somewhere to reverse the course in the championship race. But anyway, there you are. Mm. Right. Any final you can do it this year in the barges in Sodstad. <laughs> Reverse the yeah. course. They have um there were also was um um the class flags that matter interest. I was the international close flag, and that was for yachts. Yellow flag with black circle in center. The uh class the class flag for the center boards, this was before well, when were Shannon's tell us? Nineteen 20, was it? 21 or 22? Anyway, but center, they were still called center boards. Letter N of the international court, co code flag, blue and white flag checkered. And the class flag for the WAGs was the letter T. Now there's an interesting one. That was a WAG flag in that stage. Uh, and it was the international code flag, uh, red, white, and blue. And so maybe that's where it came from. And then the class flag for the motors, because there was also motor racing and this uh, motorboat racing, uh, was V, um, white flag with red cross diagonally placed. But that's all I know about this flag stuff. Thank you. Thanks all.